So, first of all, thank you so much for uh, taking this time for the Bombay Chartered Accountant Society. We are into our 50th year of our journal, which started way back in 1969. Mm -hmm. So, this entire year has been a special year for us. And we have been doing certain interviews throughout the year. Uh, we are coming to the close of the year in March. And uh, this is a great opportunity to uh, keep a focus mm -hmm. on internal audit. Uh, I'm Raman and she's Nandita. Uh, both of us nice have been you. associated, thank you, both of us have been associated with the society for a very long time and have done uh, work uh, voluntarily and uh, we'll start with the interview since we have uh, already spent a lot of time uh, at the beginning. Uh, first we want to uh, start with a question, uh, if you can share with us and this is question for both of you. Uh, you know your early days uh, or three, four milestones in your own careers uh, which shaped you and you know which made an impact. Uh, that would be nice uh, to hear from you. Sure. So I'll, I'll start. Sure. Uh, so I actually did not uh, originally uh, wanted to become internal auditor. I started as um, uh, external auditor. So I started accounting in school uh, and uh, naturally my uh, career path was to become CPA and then getting to the external audit firm. So I did. Uh, so I passed CPA, I became uh, an auditor at Arthur Anderson, which no longer exists, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought it was the greatest profession in the world. And, you know, as I entered the uh, firm and first year passed, second year passed, I became senior. Third year, come third year, I was feeling a little complacent. You know, obviously this is not a criticism to the profession of accounting, but, you know, clearly you will look at the year and adjustments and then you make the, uh, all the accounts and tick and tie and then, you know, write the uh, report in the same format. Clearly there are different uh, clients, different industries, but yet your process is somewhat uh, similar year over year. So I started to look outside. I know you're smiling because <laughs> I know. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and you are probably there as well. And that's when I started looking outside and then I had an opportunity to actually uh, move into the industry. I became, um, I, so I took off to become a controller of a French bank operating in Tokyo uh, and replacing someone who was to retire. So I had no prior banking experience, so I went in, the bank was uh, gracious enough to put me into two months training. You know, I went through the uh, different uh, parts of the bank, uh, whether it's trading, uh, you know, settlement, the credit, uh, finance, and compliance, uh, legal, you know, all that stuff, right? So after two months, my boss called me up and then, uh, you know, he pulled me aside and says, uh, Maurice, our new training is about to finish. By the way, I have something to tell you. Uh, the gentleman who was supposed to retire decided not to retire. <laughs> so he said, you have two choices. You either actually leave the bank or you actually start the internal audit department. <laughs> so I said, wow, you know, this is actually a big blow because they doubled my salary. <laughs> you know, I was actually very happy with what I was doing. So I did not want to leave the bank, so I decided to just become internal auditor. And that was uh, actually the beginning of my audit career. And it was actually a huge you know, sort of jump going over. So uh, that I, I actually cursed that gentleman, you know, who decided not to retire. But actually, it turned out that it was the best opportunity, you know, for me to actually become internal auditor because internal audit is actually different in each and every engagement. It's very exciting. You learn so much, so deep about the organization. Whereas when I was external auditor. Again, this is not a criticism, but you know, you, you, you're focused in finance. And really, yes, other parts of the organization that gets to finance is less important than looking at the finance. But it, being internal, that you need to know everything about the organization. So uh, I keep learning about it. And uh, I've actually changed uh, organizations, but uh, uh, so I moved from uh, French bank to uh, German bank, to American bank, and then now I'm insurance. But I have always been in the internal audit line, and it's always, you know, just excites me every day coming into the office. Thank you, Richard. Well, I think you asked for two or three kind of milestones that, uh, that ended up shaping 
the course of my career. And <clears throat> so what I'll probably do is sort of fast forward. I, I came out of um, college and went into internal audit uh, 43 years ago. So I've been uh, in this profession for a long time. Um, I worked in the, in the U.S. government. I was an auditor uh, for 20, over 20 years for the Army, a uh, civilian auditor for the U.S. Army. Then I uh, spent uh, some time uh, in the U.S. Postal Service where I was the Deputy Inspector General and then the Inspector General of a state-owned company, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is the largest producer of electricity in the United States. And then I, I had the opportunity to retire uh, rather young. I was 47, I think, and I took a retirement. I uh, had an opportunity to do that because of some uh, wrinkles in the law. Um, and go governing civil service employment in the United States. So that was a, a really important uh, milestone because at that point I had to decide what was I going to do with the rest of my life because while I retired I, I knew it was really more of a career change. And uh, so the, the president uh, of the IIA at that time was a gentleman named Bill Bishop uh, who's quite an icon in the history of the IIA. And he convinced me that I wanted to come to uh, Florida and uh, work uh, at the IIA as sort of the equivalent of like the chief operations officer. Um, and so first I was a little reluctant because I thought, okay, I've been in government my whole career. I'm not sure I want to go into a not-for-profit uh, association. But he was very persuasive. And so the next thing I knew, uh, we packed up and moved to Florida and I joined the IIA. So that was uh, in the year uh, 2001. Um, three years later, um, he passed away very suddenly. It was a, it was a sad time for the IIA. Um, but it uh, was time for me to think about doing something different. And, uh, and so I took a reversed uh, career path. Most people come out of uh, a college with an accounting degree, like Morrison, and they go into the public accounting field. Um, and then maybe later they do internal audit. I spent my, my life doing internal audit. Um, and then when I was 50 years old, I joined a PwC. Uh, so I was, uh, I was kind of back, did it backwards. I, I, I joke that I, I put on my backpack for the first time and went <laughs> off to work for a big accounting firm. Um, and I spent five years with PwC in, uh, in uh, the United States. I became the national practice leader for internal audit advisory services, which was part of the internal audit practice that PwC had. And so that was the second milestone. And then the third one uh, was uh, at the end of my time at PwC, um, the IIA uh, asked me to come back, the board asked me to come back as the CEO. That was 10 years ago. And so uh, I have been uh, uh, back in a role of being a, a, a leader in this profession, uh, along with our chairman. I serve as a spokesman for IIA and, and a champion for internal audit in the world. So those are three milestones that just sort of jump out at me that sort of say, how did I get from there to here? So both of you actually stand for the label pin that you gave, I love internal audit. Yes. During your career, did you feel that you would probably consider or you had a faint thought that you may consider other options? I have, absolutely. And I've always had an opportunity to uh, do something different. And this is the beauty of you know, being um, you know, manager or head of internal audit because you actually have uh, contact with your stakeholders. They see you doing a great work, helping them. And then they always say, well, why don't you come over, help me to do my job. So I've had numerous opportunity uh, to get into the business uh, because they wanted me to actually come in, help them as their COOs or CAOs. Um, but I've always said, well, thank you, but I'd rather actually see you from the independent point of view and then help you because that you get actually best out of me, you know, being there rather than you actually confine me in certain, you know, area. And my CEOs and audit committees has always said, yes, that's actually a better op option for you, right? So that's um, because I love what I do. And uh, so I guess I'm good at what I do, you know, when I love it. So that's really my experience. Yeah, I, I actually did leave very briefly um, early in my career and, and, uh, and, to, and did something else. I had been in internal audit for about 10 years and the opportunity came up to within the organization I was with within an army organization in the United States. I had the opportunity to do something slightly different um, 
it was what they called operations research analysis. It's basically a fancy term for cost analysis. Um, and so I left internal audit and moved over to a different department there. And I really gained a lot, grew a lot, learned a lot. I've shared some of those experiences in, in my books. But I, I got to the point um, some three years, to, it wasn't quite three years after I moved into that uh, organization, I got to a place where I was asked to come back to internal audit as the chief audit executive. Um, and I think I had to leave to move up. And I think that's a lesson that we all have to be uh, ready to, uh, to, to take advantage of. There are times where uh, you may not be able to go directly up to the next step in the stair. You have mm -hmm. to maybe change stairway, mm -hmm. and, uh, and then you continue to yeah. ascend. My question for you uh, would be that what really got you interested in IIA activity? You explained that you had uh, uh, Bill Bishop who uh, persuaded you to join, mm -hmm. but we find that many people join sometimes. So even if they get interested, they're not able to sustain that interest right. because it requires a lot of commitment uh, beyond your work to be able to work in the capacity that you all have worked. So if there is some learning from there, we would be very happy sure. to know. Uh, so I have been on and on associated with the IIA since um, 1993. Uh, and I became the member in 1995, uh, well, actually officially, because that's when I got my CIA, Certified Internal Auditor. I started the association by necessity. Like I told you that I was actually asked to uh, uh, become the head of internal audit and create, actually establish the audit department at the uh, French bank where, you know, I had a choice about either leaving or <laughs> doing the, starting the internal audit. So I, I did start and then I actually, I was looking for the reference material about what is it internal audit, what, what are the standards, what are the things that w I need to do. So I ran into the IIA Japan and asked for all the materials <coughs> that they have. So they gave me uh, IPPF back then, you know, the standards and the code of ethics and, you know, whole um, entire, you know, reference material so that I can study. And that's when I actually started to study CI, Certified Internal Audit as well. So, so I was actually learning about the internal audit by associating with the IIA. And then after I got CIA, and uh, I was actually the second Japanese who passed the CIA. Uh, technically, living in Japan, I was the first because the first Japanese CIA was actually living abroad, right? So, and back then, it was actually, the CIA exam was only given in English. It wasn't actually translated into Japanese. This is you know, 1993 and 4. Uh, so they looked me up and they said, well, since you passed the CI exam, you can actually do something for the organization. So sure enough, I actually started to help the, uh, um, to give seminars, the um, uh, courses uh, in CIA uh, prep courses, and then, you know, help the organization in speaking in the seminar, the conferences. I have also helped the, um, uh, working with Arthur Anderson to translate the survey that they did in 1995. And we've actually made a presentation in the international conference in Paris. So that was the first international conference that I participated in the IIA. And I saw the crowd, I saw the, uh, you know, the people's actually enthusiasm and their passion and, you know, getting into this profession, like, wow, that was, that was huge, um, you know, morale booster for me to be part of this great uh, organization that has so international. Even back then, it was actually quite international in 1995. And so that actually got me started about, you know, getting into more involved in the organization. So, but that's really and I'm here now after, uh, what, 25 years in doing this, you know, wonderful thing, so. I was actually, uh, I was actually involved in the IA in a volunteer role long before I joined as a staff person. Uh, Bill Bishop knew who I was because of the work that I had done uh, on the volunteer side. So probably came into the IA about the same time uh, that Morrison did. I came in around uh, 1994. 
Um, I was asked right away um, by I staff to join one of the international committees. Um, I was on the, the government relations committee for a little while. Um, and then I moved over to the standards board, uh, the internal audit standards board. And it happened to be a time when the IIA was completely revising the standards, the, what we call the Red Book or the International Professional Practices Framework Forerunner. And so I was on this, uh, this uh, standards board, internal audit standards board, during a very uh, dynamic time. And uh, I helped to craft a lot of the standards uh, related to consulting work by internal audit. And so um, I, I was asked then to become the chairman of the standards board. So I was actually on the standards board as the chairman and also on the global board of directors uh, when, I, uh, when I was asked to come to the IA the first time when Bill approached me. Um, of course, I resigned those volunteer positions and took the staff role. Um, and then even while I was gone during that period when, when I left the IA and I was with PwC, um, I was very, I became very active again as a volunteer. I, I chaired the uh, uh, International Conferences Committee for three years, then I moved <coughs> on to the North American Board, and then I was the chairman of the North American Board and back on the global board and had to resign again uh, to join staff for the second time. So m for me, it's been, a, it's been a, uh, an alternating pattern of being a uh, volunteer and then staff and then volunteer and then staff again. Uh, but you know, I think what it what it says, it, the the transition I was able to make so seamlessly back and forth. I think what that demonstrates is how closely bound our volunteers and our staff are mm. in the mission of supporting the IA. It was not that difficult to put take one hat off and put another one on. Right. I've always stayed on the volunteer role because I have a day job too. <laughs> that <laughs> pays my bill. I have a day job. <laughs> well, I know you do because you're paid by the <laughs> IA. I'm not, although they actually cover my travel expenses to certain. <laughs> so I've actually started international. So that was the Japanese side and then I became the uh, governor uh, or director in IA Japan in 1998. Uh, that's when we started to translate the CI exam because I actually helped, uh, you know, together with a few other people to, you know, uh, we saw the opportunity that this certification, the globally recognized, it's a single set of certification. Uh, I, you know, oppose the single uh, standards, right? So there is no other organization like this. And then so we saw the opportunity. So. Before we translated into Japanese, there were only one or two um, actually candidates who actually participated. After we translate, it started with 120, and then now uh, we have actually uh, up to now about over 7,000 CIAs in Japan. So it was great, um, you know, things that we've done. Um, and then for the international side, I actually joined the uh, what uh, was called uh, Board of Region, uh, which is now called PCB. Uh, so that's actually the uh, um, committee that creates the uh, CI exam. So we used to actually go through all the exam questions one by one uh, and then, you know, uh, gauge the difficulty because we actually want to achieve certain difficulties uh, and then we debated how this, you know, question should be written. So we were rewriting <laughs> the exam questions. That really helped me to see so much about this profession and then uh, I moved from uh, PCB to the global board uh, and became the board member. And then uh, in 2006, I became uh, part of the executive committee. So that was uh, my first uh, executive committee experience. I stayed on the uh, EC executive committee for two years. Um, and I actually wanted to continue, but financial crisis hit. And I was with JP Morgan running the uh, uh, audit for Asia Pacific. And my boss told me not to do this volunteer work anymore because I had to focus on my day job, right? So I had to actually step down. And then I then came back to become the board member. Uh, and then I stepped down from the board because there's a certain period that you, know, you can serve. And then after that, you have to actually do something else. So I became a member of the International Relations Committee. And then my chance of becoming the executive committee second time around came uh, three years ago. Uh, so it's three years ago, right? Uh, was it four years ago? I guess, well, yeah, yeah, at least four. Yeah, yeah, four years ago, sorry. So then I actually, you know, went through that ranks. So, and then I became the chairman. Uh, so so it's, it's been a journey. But like Richard said, it, this organization is very flexible. 
uh, and you know we nurture good people actually going through the volunteer ranks and uh, very often we see actually good volunteer become staff you know just like Richard <laughs> so <laughs> yes you know you've chosen this theme emphasize the basics elevate the standards this was very refreshing because in today's time everybody looks at a theme which is very technology driven very intense very so this is something which signifies a simplicity which one doesn't always see what made you choose this thing right and how do you want to take it forward uh, we saw some of it we saw that extremely interesting YouTube video of yours also. Oh, uh, thank you. So thank <laughs> you. It, with the help of uh, IIA staff, uh, particularly John Babinchak, uh, has been a significant help to, uh, you know, making that interesting video. Uh, it's on YouTube, so you all should actually watch. Uh, it's free. <laughs> so, you know, this, it doesn't cost you anything. Um, uh, you're right. So this, we are actually living in a very complex world, uh, you know, driven by the uh, internet uh, and IoT, AI, robotics. You know, new things are happening. You know, all digitized, but we're still internal auditors. What we do uh, doesn't really change. How we do things changes completely. Right? Twenty years ago, we didn't have internet. Now everything is driven by internet. But what we produce, like audit report very much the same or we you know independently evaluate the control environment and then protect the organization help the business to do uh, enhance the control that doesn't change right so I thought that and besides you know being a professional you have to stand on certain ground right like the standards and we have always focused on that but you know, clearly, if we look at the uh, common body of knowledge survey that we run every five to six years, uh, the conformance to the standard, which, well, you're, you're professional, you understand that if you don't conform to the standard, you can't even practice, right? And that's the basics that we have. So whatever that we are facing with, we always have to keep the basics right. And then we actually build things on top of that. Right. Whether it's the uh, uh, technology knowledge, whether it's the cyber security knowledge, or other things that actually comes with it, uh, with the business acumen. But you have to have the professional ground basics right. So that's why I always thought that standard is so important, you know, to our day-to-day -day internal audit activities. So therefore, I actually picked that as a thing. So is acting a natural talent or IIA got you into it? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't really act, uh, but I was actually reading things off the script. Yes, if you contact what you're actually referring. And I actually tried to do, tried to be natural, but uh, it was actually fun making that uh, video. And that probably came through probably, you know, to the viewer that I was actually having really fun. So. So we would we would like a few more videos like that. I think they um, really. I'll, really I'll talk to Richard about that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. It, it does actually take effort to create that video. Although my my part was only one day, it took another two months for other things to you know come into play. So. Richard, this question's for you. You have been a prolific writer, speaker, two books, uh, blogs for eight nine years now, videos. Uh, how did you develop this art of communicating and being sort of the cheerleader for the profession of internet? I'm being so disciplined ah. to be able to publish week after week after week. Yeah. Actually, next month will be uh, the 10th year that we've written the blog. Uh, so it's, uh, it's been quite a, quite a journey. I know we've, uh, the last time I looked, uh, we were already over 400 blogs since we started. Um, you know, to me, I don't, I don't know that when I... When I wrote that first blog in February of 2009, I remember um, it was about the crisis, the impact of the financial crisis on internal audit. And I don't think I said then to myself, I'm doing something that I'll be doing for the next decade. Um, but what I found was that members of our profession um, around the world were starved for very contemporary, informal, short, digestible, perspectives on things that are going on. 
And so as we started, um, we started to get a lot of very positive feedback. So we made it a regular, the, the IA already had a couple of bloggers, so I just joined the ranks of the bloggers, but I suddenly began to realize this is, uh, this is something people really gravitate toward. No matter where I go in the world, people will come up to me. I've had people coming up this week saying, oh, I, I read your blog every week. And, uh, and so I'm blessed to have the platform because um, I'm, I'm really uh, sort of just a vessel to deliver uh, information, I think, to this profession. Um, last year, I think we, the blog was read more than 250,000 times. Uh, so it's, it, is, it is an important way to communicate in the 21st century. And then if you take the blog and then you layer on it social media, uh, so I, I posted a blog two days ago and then immediately pushed out the link on LinkedIn and on Twitter and then the IIA pushed it out and then before you know it everybody in the world who has an interest knows about the topic and then they can decide whether they want to take advantage of it. The, the books, um, I, I don't know that I really ever expected I'd write a book but um, back in 2013 the, the Research Foundation, at that time we called it the Research Foundation, the Internal Audit Foundation, our publishing arm, came to me and and said, you know, your blogs have been very popular. Uh, why don't you uh, share some uh, perspectives via a book? And uh, so I thought, well, I don't know what I would really uh, share. Uh, but then I started thinking, you know, I've, I've had the, the, the privilege of being in a, a profession for 40 years, and, and I meet all these young uh, professionals and, uh, and internal auditors who are struggling with what do you do the first time you have a, a very tough meeting where the client or the, the person you audited is arguing with you and then what do you do when, the, uh, when you have the opportunity uh, to audit but then the risks all change and I started thinking you know what I really ought to do is just sort of package all these major lessons that I learned over the course of these 40 years into a book and so we called it lessons learned on the audit trail play mm. off of the words audit trail and uh, we published it, um, and it's a very popular book. Uh, I, I know that, uh, that, that the more than 15,000 copies were consumed worldwide. Um, it, it was uh, translated into Spanish and French and traditional Chinese and simplified Chinese. And so suddenly it was a very popular uh, platform for delivering information too. And then uh, a couple of years later, uh, the uh, Internal Audit Foundation uh, sensing that the first book had gone really well, came back and said, would you write a, another book? And uh, this one, the second book, uh, the Trusted Advisors uh, book uh, that I spoke about uh, 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 here this week, or well, at least uh, signed, signed books for the, the attendees, um, it really sort of picked, off, picked up where the first book left off because I concluded at the end of Lessons Learned on the Audit Trail, I concluded by talking about what does it take to be a trusted advisor in the 21st century. But after the book was published, that's the first book, Lessons Learned on the Audit Trail, I really started reflecting and I thought that I had oversimplified um, the, 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 the message about what does it take to be a trusted advisor. So we went back, we did some research, we gathered perspectives from chief audit executives around the world and then we put this uh, second book together, Trusted Advisors, which was even more popular than the first. I think we uh, may soon see 20,000 copies of that. And it's also in multiple languages, English, um, uh, Spanish, uh, Japanese, uh, Portuguese, okay. uh, and uh, I'm, I'm missing something, Chinese, I think, Chinese, yes. Japanese, yeah. Anyway, so the point is these books have been very uh, a very popular way to share information with the profession. I'm actually in the process now, we're just sending it off to the to the editor of, of taking the first book, um, the uh, Le Lessons Learned on the Audit Trail, and, and refreshing it because uh, the last five years have taught us a lot about the speed of risk um, and how risk uh, dynamics uh, can change everything that an internal auditor needs to focus on. So the title of the refreshed edition is the speed of risk, hmm. lessons learned on the audit trail. Hmm. So we go back and we talk about some of those lessons that we explored in the first book and we overlay on it the, the, the impact that, that a dynamic risk environment has. Uh, we talk about auditing culture, we, uh, we talk about uh, uh, the, the, the importance of innovation and how do you audit at the speed of risk. So that book will be out in March. 
we all are, I think, looking forward to it. Uh, that's a huge amount of contribution. If you, if you want to just quickly tell us anything specifically that readers or users of these or you know, users of your blog or people who have watched the video have shared anything that they have benefited out of it. You know, I've been, I've been amazed at how um, uh, people have taken the books and used them as teaching aids. I, I've had uh, uh, internal auditors come up to me and say that they bought a copy of the book for everyone in the audit department hmm. and everyone was responsible for digesting a chapter in the book and then they would have a lunch and learn session where they would all gather around the table um, and this would maybe, if there's 10 chapters in the book, they take and do this over a 10 week period. And, uh, and so um, then it becomes really almost like a, a book of the month club or a chapter of the month club. Um, that, that, that was kind of interesting and I thought uh, uh, fascinating. We had a chapter, uh, one of our chapters, uh, sort of a, like, like our, our institutes, but in America we call them chapters. I think it's the Kansas City chapter who took the, the trusted advisors and they put a, a different program together for each chapter and that was their monthly wow. program for the whole year. And then at the end of the year they asked me to come uh, and be part of the program that wrapped up the year. So their whole theme for the year was around the book. So these have, uh, this has all been very exciting. Uh, but but I, I, I hasten to add uh, that I think what I, what I do in sharing this information is that I serve as sort of that conduit from hmm. the IIA to share information with, uh, with uh, internal audit professionals and with members and others who really don't understand much about the internal audit profession. So uh, I, don't, I don't take a lot of credit for what we're doing here. I think it's all part of a bigger uh, mission that the IIA has to be a voice uh, for the profession. And right. so that's something I'm very proud right. to be able to do. Right. So, awesome. so my video is the same way. Uh, you know, it's somewhat entertaining. So it's actually geared toward more millennials and people who are actually the stakeholder of internal auditor to really understand what is the internal audit is about and what is standard and why is certification important to a profession. And so that's, that's really the reason why I actually uh, created that video. And People come to me and they said, yes, they like it and they've actually used it. So I said, go ahead and use it. You know, it's been actually uh, uh, translated into a number of languages. Uh, so you know, they actually uh, superimpose their own language and then run it uh, in their conferences. So I said, go ahead and do it in their you know, own teams. So they, they seem to like it. So. I think it's interesting because <clears throat> for decades, what the IA would do each year when they got a new chapter, a new, I'm sorry, a new pro, uh, chairman, is that they would uh, put a, a cover article together on the magazine and feature that chairman in the magazine, so a printed edition. And so somewhere 10, 10 plus years ago, we started this process of saying the chairman should be alive, not just confined to a written page have an opportunity to interact with the profession in a live uh, video context. And, and so without a doubt of all of the ones we've done over the years, and hopefully none of the other chairmen are watching this, but Maury's um, I think was, uh, was, the, was the most entertaining. Uh, I think it, it was the most informative in some ways because it took very, um, uh, very complex uh, issues and, and created a message that people are going to be able to ingest. You, you can't share a written page on a magazine that's published mainly in, in America. You can't share that like you can YouTube. So I think what we're seeing now is that yes. the, the chairman's video is, is very much a reflection of evolution in society in general. This questions for uh, both of you. Uh, the image of an internal auditor is often perceived to be uninspiring. You know, after all, you are Being an auditor, counters. it's more internal <laughs> focus, you are more introverted. You know, that's how the world perceives an internal auditor and for that matter, even an external auditor. How do you feel the image of this image that people perceive should undergo a makeover? Is there anything that's happening in this direction? Well, I think it, I th I think it starts with those of us in the profession. Um, you know, every profession, there probably are stereotypes about it. There are, stereotypes about internal audit. Um, 
but yet you can go to a lot of companies and they don't see those stereotypes at all because their internal audit is alive, it's vibrant, it's dynamic, it's eng engaged in all the key risks of the organization. So I think it's up to each one of us uh, in this profession worldwide to make this profession uh, uh, not only meaningful for us, but, but to be able to convey what the uh, potential and the opportunity is so that our boards and management and even the people in the organization who are, who are audited uh, begin to appreciate what internal audit really is. It, it has evolved. I mean, it's gone from the era of bean counting, uh, more, more used the term, and I've used it before too, but I say in the 21st century we have to be more, uh, know how to do more than count the beans. We have to know how, to, how uh, they're marketed, how they're grown, how they're harvested, how they're taken to market. We have to know everything about the life cycle of beans, and so I think we have to be able to convey that in a way that gets people excited. I, I echo what Richard said. So every conference that I go to, uh, by the way, this is my 20th destination oh. where, since I became chairman in May. So it's actually a great privilege and uh, opportunity for me to actually talk to our members and then the profession in general. So those who actually attend the conference, I always ask them, who's actually representing a profession? It's you, each one of you, right? And then when your stakeholder thinks about internal audit, they think about you, not the you know, auditor in general, because they have actually a live individual sitting in front of them. So if they don't think that they are representing internal audit, if they're, because their projection of the image actually is what is perceived as internal audit, right, from the stakeholders. So if they don't look good, we don't look good. So we need to keep them feeding the uh, information, you know, keep, educating them, keep really um, upskilling them. Yes. So, because we need to, our profession continue to evolve. So you need to keep learning and keep applying what you learn. And it is a great opportunity for us, right? But not everyone thinks this way, unfortunately. There are traditional way of thinking. And we, you know, we obviously have a diversity of uh, idea of even within our profession, you know, how people think about it traditionally to very innovatively. So we're trying to actually uh, cater for the need of every, you know, internal auditors. But we're really focusing on, you know, what's actually coming ahead, you know, as, like Richard said, you know, we are trying to be a uh, guiding light and you know, we're actually uh, having a foresight of what could potentially uh, happening in the fu future and trying to educate people in that way. So uh, related to this is a question that does the name internal auditor do any disservice to the profession? Because uh, there is a connotation of an auditor primarily because being an accountant. Mm -hmm. And as you rightly said yesterday that we have to know that we are not accountants and uh, because of the name uh, with which the profession is known, the impression is that internal auditors are an extension of the accounting profession. There have been attempts to rechristen the profession uh, as risk advisors or risk professionals or GRC professionals. Any views that you have, uh, what is there in a name or does it matter? So I, I have my personal view on this and Richard, you can follow it. To me, the name convention doesn't really matter. What matters is what we do, right? Even if we are con uh, called internal auditor, if we are actually being very innovative, if we are actually providing value to the, uh, our board audit committee and then senior management, it doesn't really matter to them. I've seen different name conventions like management reviews, uh, the uh, audit and risk reviews, and different you know connotations. But you know, at the end of the day, if you're actually doing what is considered as being counting, as opposed to you know helping the business, protecting the organization, being strategic, being innovative, uh, trying to do more with less, they will actually see it too. You know, no matter how it's been called. So that's just my opinion about the name convention. So. I agree 100%. I mean, you could, you could change the name of an airline pilot to uh, aircraft navigation engineer, but it's still an airline pilot, right? Uh, I think what we really need to be doing is we need to be focusing on what does it mean to be an internal auditor. Let's think for a moment. Uh, 15 years ago, um, the brand Apple had sort of become a tired brand. 
People thought of it as, oh, those are the iPod people, the people who did the laptops. What did Steve Jobs do? He completely redefined what Apple was all about. So I don't think you just, just, just if you have some uh, strain maybe in the way your brand is perceived, and, I don't, and by the way, I don't think that there is a broad negative perception of internal audit, but you don't just abandon the name or the brand, you simply say, we're gonna rebrand what we do, not rebrand who we are, but we're gonna elevate the level of service that we provide. So I'd like to think we're, uh, we're gonna be the Apple of the future. <laughs> Current Apple, <laughs> not the previous Apple. <laughs> <laughs> okay, coming to uh, internal audit, sort of stuff happening on the ground. In most countries, you know, unlike a uh, statutory auditor or an external auditor, this is not a legal mandate uh, to have an internal audit Correct. the way the appointment happens, the way a large number of people, stakeholders look at an internal auditor. Do you think this is an impediment to the work of an internal auditor and should the profession be free for all that you know uh, they could enter at least in some countries it's very easy to get into doing internal audit work or should there be more uh, legal thrust or legal force given to the position of an internal auditor looking at the whole yeah. world that you travel. You know, the IIA has taken the position, and I, I happen to personally agree strongly with it, that licensing uh, of internal auditors, uh, somehow uh, creating a licensed profession, is not really uh, in the best interest of the organizations we serve. Think about it. Uh, you very rarely find any statutes or regulations that license the person who's the CFO in the organization or license the, the, the other professionals, chief risk officers and others, organizations, particularly, particularly pub, public, uh, publicly traded organizations or corporations, I, I think should be free to decide how to manage uh, their affairs uh, without the long arm of government reaching in and saying, no, here's what you have to have to do this job, here are the, the credentials and the skills and the qualifications. Now, we, we're very big proponent of, of listing uh, agencies, stock exchanges, and others saying, if you're gonna be traded on our exchange, you need to have an internal audit function. Uh, I don't think we have a problem even seeing government regulations saying that organizations and companies should have an internal audit function, but it's getting into it and sort of mandating who can do it and who can't and what qualifications and credentials, because I've seen how that gets stuck in the past. If, if we had had something like that 20 years ago, it would be mandating that in order to be internal auditors, you have to be accountants. And yet today, uh, only a fraction of what internal audit does has any relationship to accounting. So I think the profession needs to be live, to be alive and to evolve, and companies should be free to decide how they're gonna resource it. So I completely agree uh, with uh, Richard, uh, you know, uh, comment. Uh, internal audit is a management tool to self-regulate itself, self-correct itself. Find the problem by your own and correct it so that companies, you know, sustainability is maintained, right? And then also, I've seen number of companies, particularly large companies, that they use internal audit as a resource pool. So training, you know, opportunity for uh, junior staff, you know, who has a uh, large potential to step up go through internal audit because internal being in internal audit you actually see end to end the organization with the eye of CEO. So it's a wonderful training ground for anyone who actually wants to learn the organization, how they make money, how they lose money, what are the control that needs to actually, you know, exist. So a uh, number of companies use actually internal audit to actually put people in and then have them actually uh, train it for a few years and put them back to the business, right? So it's a great resource training tool. Clearly, um, you know, independent view is, um, you know, um, uh, is produced so that the company continue to uh, make themselves better. So just, just to piggyback on the question, that you know when we come to independence issues and there have been some recent uh, events where you know the work 
of it, the internal audit has reviewed the work which they had actually done in their consulting capacity. Mm -hmm. So there are these issues and in a larger corporate governance framework, shouldn't internal auditors have some, some stature which, you know, people can point to that, you know, this work was done by an internal auditor and the board relied upon it or, you know, some such thing to bring internal auditors a little bit. Uh, See, we have that, I think. We have that in, in our standards and in the uh, professional practices framework. Uh, I think you know internal audit is, uh, is, a, is a resource that can be relied upon if those internal auditors are following uh, these globally recognized professional standards. Um, I, I think those standards themselves have embedded in them the safeguards to talk about the very things you're talking about. We should never audit our own work. Uh, but as a consultant, or we prefer to talk about it as an advisor, yes. as an advisor, I'm not telling you what to do and I'm not doing it for you. I'm simply saying, based on the expertise I have, these are the things that I think you should be mindful of if you're going to implement new controls, or these are key risks that you should be working to mitigate. And I can do that informally or I can do that formally, but if I do it informally, I can still audit it later on because I didn't tell you what to do. So I think there's the uh, perhaps myth or misunderstanding about this consulting work that the internal audit does. So just to be clear about what it actually means uh, in practice is that, let's say, I, I, I've actually gone through this number of times, but I've been asked to uh, be part of the steering committee of large integration project, right? What it actually means is that you become part of the decision making, right? If you actually sit in the steering committee as a member. So our standard actually tells us not to do it because it impairs our independence. But instead, I actually sit in the steering committee as an observer, but continue to engage that project. Where you are looking at the controls, making recommendations, validating what's been done, uh, and then test them so that you know, you get real-time feedback to the uh, project, and then they can continue to self-correct uh, in the right course and making right decisions. That's consulting. And it's not impairing the independence at all, right? Because the, as Richard said, decisions are made not by the internal auditors, but internal re recommends and then helps the business to move things forward while management actually makes decisions, right? So that's, that's really what, consulting is about. So I don't really see any conflict of doing this, right? It's not, some people think that, yes, consultant, you know, it's like external consultants coming in, making decisions for the company. That's not really what we're doing. So I, I just want to make sure that, you know, this is very clear about, you know, what the consulting is all about. You know, um, as the um world around us is changing. The competencies and skill sets that internal auditors need to own has changed tremendously. Oh, absolutely. So what are the few things that the future internal auditor must add to his bucket of, or his or her bucket of competencies to remain relevant? Right. I'm talking of survival. I'm not even talking of growth. Yes. So future is now already. Yeah. And this is one of the uh, Richard actually comment. Uh, <laughs> I took it from his slide. But uh, so. We're faced with internet. Everything is on a uh, smartphone, right? Uh, no one goes to the bank branch anymore. You know, banking transaction to travel, uh, booking to buying insurance, everything is done by phone and you know, laptop. How do we actually deal with this situation as an internal auditor? First of all, you have to be tech savvy. I mean, there is n the line between IT auditor, what used to be called, I guess when I started it, uh, we are, it used to be called EDP auditors. Now, <laughs> take an IT auditor now. You remember those days, right? Uh, and then to business auditors, to finance auditors, the lines are all being blurred because there is no process exists without technology. So you, it can't be black box, right? You audit front and then the back, but you don't actually audit in between. You can't do that. So you have to understand how the process flows. So this is one. Facilitation skill, because audit is all about listening, thinking, communicating. So you have to really facilitate the conversation that goes, right? 
And in many, um, many audit shops now, particularly mine, we are actually starting to incorporate self-assessment process as part of the audit process. So naturally, you have to facilitate that discussion. So you talk about agile process, the uh, scrum meeting. You have to actually chair the scrum meeting and bring the information out from your auditee or risk management or compliance or legal, finance. All this actually helps to make the internal audit better. Right? So that's the second uh, uh, and, uh, characteristics or the uh, skills that you need to have. And analytical ability, of course. Uh, and to think deeply about what is it the problem is. What is the root cause of the problem? Why is it happening? Because if you don't actually get the root cause right, and if you just uh, remediate superficially, the problem will come back. We don't want that to happen because we actually invest in remediation, right? We need to kill that root cause and then move on. So. Those three things that I would actually think that that's really the skill sets necessary. I, I have to speak a lot these days about um, the importance of internal auditors being able to provide foresight. <coughs> the, the profession, the origins of internal audit was to look behind. Yes. What happened last year, were the records maintained correctly, uh, were controls adequate, but it was in the past. Then, then as the profession evolved and matured, we became more adept at talking about the present. Okay, here are things that we see now that need to be corrected. But as I look to the future, we really are going to have to be able to look to the future because the things that happened yesterday are, are yesterday. They're not, they're not the things that we seek. I, I, I spoke earlier this week and I said, you know, you, you seek out experts for the future, not for the past. Hmm. So I think internal auditors as a profession and as individuals are going to have to become much more adept at looking forward. Um, we speak a lot about what are the threats that artificial intelligence presents to our profession. Um, I, I often say if you're, if you're only providing hindsight, that's something artificial intelligence can easily do. If you're only providing hindsight and insight, you're still likely a threat threatened by, by artificial intelligence and some of the other technology that's coming. The things that will make it more difficult for you to be disintermediated um, are, are your ability to leverage your professional knowledge, your professional judgment, and to give the organization perspectives about what the future holds. So just, just on the full side, if I may, um, I think we're in the transition. So in order to actually have foresight, you have to understand the hindsight deep enough. And then you have to actually understand the trend so that you can predict what could potentially happen. Obviously, there are some unknown factors that could potentially uh, change the course of what had happened to what could potentially happen in the future. But in most cases, you can certainly predict if you actually understand deep enough about the processes, the risks, and controls. So this is, with the help of data analytics, machine learning, AI, this is what we are actually currently dealing with, right? So once we have the complete basis of the assurance uh, with AI machine learning, then we can move into the uh, foresight part. Without this, you can't really have foresight, right? So that's my view. My next question is for you. Uh, George Orwell, in his novel Animal Farm, very finely said that all animals are equal, but pigs are more equal. This was a novel about where the animals took over a farm and mm -hmm. they were running and the pigs came into leadership. So they made rules which were very different for mm -hmm. different animals mm -hmm. and it was meant to be a democracy. Now when I look at internal auditors and when, uh, based on my experience, uh, this is what a lot of chief internal auditors feel, that while it is the role, it's a, you are a functional head, you are heading a function, you are heading a department, within organization all departments are equal, but internal auditors are less equal. It reflects in the compensation levels, it reflects in the priority given to their IT requirements, the technology requirements. Very often, it reflects in what meetings they would attend and what meetings they would not attend. 
Do you have a view on this? Is this something that you see uh, in many countries? Uh, because this is one area of concern that a lot of chief internal auditors uh, hear that we find. In India? In India. Okay. And uh, even uh, when we've looked at companies which have presence uh, globally, this right. is something that... Okay. So my past experience working in the different countries in uh, mostly in financial institutions, I have actually not felt that way. Uh, perhaps because I'm very fortunate working in uh, financial industry uh, where internal audit is actually expected to play a very important role. Uh, there's a regulatory expectation uh, and in some countries there's a regulatory requirement for us to do that. Um, perhaps looking at the industry, it may be slightly different uh, view uh, because the role that they play uh, may be slightly different from the financial industry. But I always believe that the um, uh, respect is earned, it's not given. It depends on what this chief audit executive is doing. And it's important that you can't really expect to come into chief audit executive and then you, uh, you, you know, everyone respects you because they're waiting to see what you do. If you are actually providing great value, significant issue to the uh, board and the uh, senior management, they will look to you and say, I have this problem, can I talk to you? And they'll start calling you and says, I have this new project, can you come and help me? So I'm actually one of the 10 people who runs the entire company for AIG, where, AIG, where I work. Uh, I'm always included in the meeting. And I, I, I don't want to brag about this, but because they recognize that what we can do for them is not just being counting. It's helping them to make things better. And so, once again, this needs to be earned. This isn't given. And we can, you know, certain CAs choose to remain, you know, what they actually want to be within their remit. But that's, that's their prerogative. But, so my point is that it depends. I think, uh, I think it's fair to say that companies get the quality of internal audit they pay for. Hmm. So if they want to, uh, if they want to cut corners, if they only want to have five internal auditors for a $5 billion company, then they're probably not going to get a, a whole lot of value out of that internal audit function because they've spread it too thin. Um, if they choose uh, not to compensate uh, chief audit executive and not to resource the department so that it can attract the best talent, then they're going to get what they pay for. So I think that to a certain extent, it, it, the, the fault here falls on both sides because I think internal audit and whether it's an internal audit in a big company or government agency or you name it, they have an obligation, uh, as, as Maury said, to earn the respect and, and all of the, the things that go with that, including uh, resources and compensation and everything else. Um, if they don't, uh, it's going to be very, very difficult. So what I always encourage people to do is absolutely shoot for the moon, you know, as far as what you do, what you deliver, the value you deliver, because I tend to be an optimist. I believe good things come mm -hmm. to those who really put yep. forth the yep. greatest effort. Then I think it's incumbent upon management and the board to recognize that and to reinforce it in terms of the level of resources that you have and, and the caliber of, of folks that you have. The first time I became a chief audit executive was uh, 30 years ago, actually. Um, and the internal audit department had been uh, for, for decades uh, considered to be sort of the, the uh, industry or the in-house joke. People said, ah, <laughs> that's the internal audit. The chief audit executive didn't really demonstrate any of the kind of attributes that we talk about. And so they really wanted to change things. They wanted to break the model that when I say they, the, the management of the organization. And so they brought me in. I was 34 years old. They brought me in and they said, you've proven that you can do all these things when you were not in internal audit. We want you to go back to internal audit and, and remake it, reform it. And, uh, and I went in with that attitude. And uh, within a year, 
we had taken it uh, from kind of the worst internal audit department in the Army to one of the very best. And then suddenly I found that the management in the organization really valued what it was doing and, and they, they said, oh, we don't want Richard to leave. Let's give him a promotion. I didn't even ask for it. They said they wanted, they wanted to give me this. So I tend to think that if you put your best foot forward as a chief audit executive and as a staff of internal audit, you're going to reap the rewards that you deserve. Um, this question is about uh, recent corporate failures and the role of internal audit. Any couple of lessons that both of you may want to share for the internal auditors, seeing what has happened in the UK, in Europe, and of course America, and closer home to ILNFS in India. Any, anything that internal auditors need to wake up to and learn? I, I, I shared uh, my message this week and I, I talk about it a lot. The five scariest words in the English language are, <laughs> where were the internal auditors? <laughs> and, and it <laughs> almost always comes when there's a major scandal or collapse or calamity. Uh, it, it may have nothing to do with the internal auditors, but somebody will ask a question hmm. uh, and say, well, where were the internal auditors? Why didn't they see <clears> this? Um, first of all, I would say internal auditors can audit anything, but they cannot audit everything. Maybe. Okay, So we always need to keep that in mind, that, they, that it is perfectly plausible that a big uh, a collapse or scandal or fraud can occur, hmm. that internal audit was focusing on all the right things and just didn't see it. I mean, we cannot audit everything unless you're willing to uh, give us thousands of people. I can tell you uh, from, from experience, you cannot audit everything. So then I think what I would say to internal auditors is to always anticipate those risks that can be the most detrimental to your organization. Those risks that can create the most destruction to shareholder value. Uh, study after study has been done. Uh, looking at what contributes, what, which risk are the, the most lethal when it comes to shareholder value. Uh, it's not financial risk. People think, oh, well, financial reporting fraud, that's what kills companies. It isn't. It's not compliance risks. Those risks together account for fewer than 20% of decline in shareholder value. It's strategic risks. It's business risks, sometimes even operational risks. It's it's companies that don't see uh, what's coming ahead. And that's where I think we're back to internal audit being there to help management identify what are the things that could cause uh, the failures and the calamities to occur. Now, some of the examples you cited, Europe and, and other elsewhere, some of those were compliance failures. Uh, some of those were frauds that occurred. But you know what? If you look deep enough, you're going to find that it was culture. It was culture in the organization. I'm giving a, a lecture later this afternoon here in uh, Mumbai on culture. It was culture in the organization that caused the compliance failures or the fraud or all the other things that took the company down. Uh, it wasn't the, 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 the compliance failure or the financial reporting fraud were symptomatic of a bigger issue, and that's where internal audit always has to have its eye. Yeah, completely agree about the culture. Uh, so. But it's, culture is something that's so fuzzy and it's difficult to audit. I mean, it's not a tangible thing. But everyone knows it's the way that things are done here, right? Everyone's exposed to that. And so how does that internal audit actually capture that intangible things and then put that into issue when everyone is feeling that this isn't the right culture, but they're still operating under that, right? So. It's actually touchy-feely things. So I, I don't actually expect that people would be doing the huge culture audit uh, to actually write this up. But instead, every day audit, you feel it. You have to talk to your senior management. You have to talk to your board. You have to talk to the field management as to why things are happening. This questioning about why people actually do things the way that they're doing things. And then we're the... Um, you know, change agent. We actually have the ability to change things, you know, within the organization. Uh, so if we can shift the bad culture or perhaps uh, unwanted culture into the uh, better culture, this, is, this would be a huge win for the internal audit and for the organization. And that's how I see it. Right. Um, I 
We have many more questions, but the time is running out. So I would like to have two questions, one personal and one on the future of the profession. So the personal question is that does your professional training as internal auditor impact your personal life? How do your close family and friends feel <laughs> about having an internal auditor amongst <laughs> them? Because nothing really remains unnoticed, right? So. Uh, well, like actually, my 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 <laughs> my brother-in-law is an internal auditor, oh. <laughs> so, and uh, I guess it runs in our family. So. <laughs> um, but we do not actually talk about internal audit issues when we actually have a family gathering. But my wife actually appreciates what I do uh, because I'm analytical. Uh, I'm somewhat logical when I'm not illogical. <laughs> so uh, that. She actually helps uh, me uh, lots of ways uh, in how I actually form my uh, ideas. And particularly, she appreciates what I do uh, for the uh, institute and what the institute actually helps me. Uh, because this institute is a wonderful organization where we have, we're close to 200,000 members uh, spanning in 170 countries. Uh, so every country we go, we bound to find, run into internal auditor and, uh, and I learned so much from uh, each and every country and also the profession itself, so it's wonderful. So. Yeah, I, my wife is an accountant as well, uh, <laughs> so uh, you know, God help our children, right? Uh, that's why <laughs> none of them went into uh, even a business degree. They, uh, they got degrees in science and liberal arts. Um, look, I, uh, I think you can't help uh, but bring some of your uh, your approaches and the way you carry out your profession into your personal life. Uh, but I think the important thing is, and I've always uh, believed this, I haven't always practiced it by any means, is that you have to carve out time in your, in your personal life to enjoy life. Uh, because it can't all be about work. Mm. Uh, you have to make time uh, to enjoy the things uh, that make life worth living. Although I, I consider this as uh, not work anymore, it's actually my mission. So I'm actually spending a lot of time doing this volunteer things for the IIA, but it's actually my joy. And, you know, I don't mind actually doing this. My wife doesn't mind uh, me doing this because I'm away from the home. It's <laughs> probably more peaceful when I'm away, <laughs> perhaps. But really, I mean, we both, my wife and I and my kids actually benefit uh, for me associated to this organization and then doing this profession. So. Uh, there is a lot of talk about engaging with the millennials, the younger minds. Uh, as a profession, how would we uh, attract the most creative, the most uh, difficult to engage with talent within the profession? And looking at the disruptions, what would be some of the coping strategies that you would like to leave as your message for our viewers and our readers? Right. Please watch my video. Those are for you, millennials. <laughs> because I, we were trying to make it very simple, trying to relate to building the career uh, by, you know, by using the analogy of constructing the building. So. I mean, it, it was actually essentially targeting for millennials to really understand the concept of, you know, how important the standard is, how important that certification program is, and then what sort of thing that internal auditors do. So please watch my video. Yes. <laughs> In the interest of time, let me just say, I think we overanalyze um, sometimes what uh, uh, differentiates uh, generations. Uh, I think millennials are a lot more like baby boomers of my generation, then they are different. I think we have a lot of the same uh, kinds of, uh, of, of interests. I can tell you we were very ambitious too uh, when, I, uh, when I was a young adult. Uh, people of my generation felt like we should own the world. Um, I think that's a natural uh, kind of phenomenon. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, from what I do hear about and what I do see, because I have at least one of my uh, daughters falls into that millennial category. Uh, these are people that are motivated uh, by a by a purpose. They don't just want a job for money. They want a purpose. Uh, there's no greater uh, opportunity to serve a purpose than to be an internal auditor and 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 to exercise your craft to make things better. 
So I think millennials will be attracted and are being attracted to internal audit, um, and I think uh, that's something we'll continue uh, to work on. Okay. So thank you so much for uh, you taking much. this time off, and we really appreciate having you here from the BCA Journal. We'll send you a copy very soon. Okay. Uh, thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks for having us. Thank, thank you for having us.